This is a... I'll, I'll come back and, and present this like, okay, you, you had to do this with sinusoids before as a way of learning abstractions. So this is, this is the same, essentially the same thing, except that the synthesis technique is one that uses delay lines. And in fact, some of you already know this, if you want to make tones like this, you just play a little white noise or something into a recirculating delay line. Those of you who don't know it will see it today. Um, so if you don't know how to make this timbre, you will know soon how to make it. Um, and this is, uh, this idea is attributed to two people working at Stanford, Karplus and Strong, so it's called Karplus Strong Synthesis. And um, it turns out that it's great for making harpsichordy kinds of sounds like that. And you can push it in a couple of ways, but then pretty much it gives you that very recognizable timbre. And if you ever hear that, you, you just say, oh, that's car plus strong. And that's kind of it. Although this is a good thing as a source for filtering. Um, what I did was I just fixed it so that there's a controllable duration. And there's a controllable bass pitch just as, as before, and this is a random melody, but that, you can elaborate on that all you want. So that's the, uh, now, with that in your, in your heads, that's a thing that you do with delay lines, but what I'm going to do is show you more, more in general what delay lines are, um, uh, like what are the, what are the uh, ra what's the range of experience that you can create using a delay line. Um, delay line simply takes something in and puts it out at some amount of time previous, or sorry, at some amount of time later, or at the present time it's putting out what it got at some previous moment. And to do it, um, simplest possible example might be, let's just use the microphone to start with, just because it'll be upsetting. Okay, so what you do to make a delay is two things. First off, you make a delay line, and to do that, the, the thing is del right. And you have to give it a name because delays like arrays and like send receive pairs um, are things that other things refer to and they have to be able to find them by name. So I'll say del write and then give it a name. And you also have to tell it, since it has to make space, you have to tell it how much space to make. Unlike arrays, delays really are just arrays, but unlike arrays, delays are things that have a uh, signal running continuously through them so that they actually have a notion of sample rate. And as a result, in a delay line, you specify it not in num the number of samples, but in the number of milliseconds, which is the usual time unit. So I'm going to ask for a five second long delay, just because I can't imagine you wanting more than that. And then you just say delay read, give it a delay name that matches the writing delay line, and then give it any, any amount of delay that you wish to have the thing delay by. And furthermore, that is a thing that you can control using a uh, message, or sorry, using numbers. I should make a number box. So here's the whole patch. I'll just take the delay read and throw it to the output. Come here. Hmm. It's complaining to me. Why? Oh, that's me. That's the uh, that's this window generating problems. Uh, okay. And now maybe if my mic is on, hello. hello. Yep. Okay. So now what you hear is me being a second previously. Second previously. Right. This is a good way to really reduce the intelligibility of speech, <laughs> by the way. Um, okay. So. If you want to change that, uh, you don't even have to specify the initial value. There's no, there's no, uh, what's the right word? There's no storage associated with reading a delay line. It's just getting storage that was made by the delay write. And so, almost as in the signal versions of send and receive, the delay write defines the delay line, and then you may have as many delay reads as you want reading from it. So, for instance, here I can dial up the amount of delay that I want in milliseconds. So here's a 132, 132 millisecond delay, and so on like that. Zero just means, well, actually, if, if you say negative, it, it makes it zero. It can't get less than that. And I'll make that a little bit better by actually giving it a range. So zero is the shortest delay it can make, which is not, hmm, well, which is basically the delay of getting through the audio system to the computer at plus PD, right? 
Um, and then you get various things. So certain delay times are just enough to make you queasy, but not enough that you can actually hear the delay. And then along and around here, you get uh, problems with speech intelligibility because the um, because there are a lot of phonemes in speech, particularly the consonants that t that typically are over in less than 50 milliseconds. And so, if you present a delayed copy of speech, you're squashing those phonemes out and, and mixing them with their neighbors, which ruins the intelligibility of the speech. And that becomes near total when you uh, push it up to 100. Uh, milliseconds, in which case you get a nice echo. For um, for purposes of, well, for thinking about it, 100 milliseconds, sound goes about a foot in a millisecond. So 100 milliseconds is 100 feet, so that's the echo from a wall that's 50 feet away from you. Okay, so that's making, okay, so this, I'm just going to save this as it is right now. It's very simple, but this is the basic deal about delay. Oh. Yes, I'm going to save this, except I'm going to save a slightly modified form of it, which is going to be this. Just to emphasize how delay reads can reuse the same delay line. Now we have two, the two speakers, each of which can have a different delay, and then you have this. All right. Oh, what do I, oh there we go. Yeah, the microphone on. And now you play an instrument of that and you get rock and roll. So delay networks are very feedback prone, and that would be a good thing to worry about. Okay, um, so this is very simple delay patch, which I will just save, and then move on to the next, next, yeah. What does the 5,000 represent? Oh, thank you, yes. So the 5,000, that's the amount of, um, that's the amount of delay line that delay write created in milliseconds. So in order to make a delay line, del write has to allocate memory because it has to continually be remembering the last five seconds of, of whatever came into it. And so you tell it how much memory you want it to grab. And you can ask it for hours, right? But I don't know any situation in which you need to. Yeah. So it just creates a tail? It's not really a tail. It's, it, um, what is a tail? So a tail. Oh. I don't know how to answer that. So, so tails are tails are things that happen after a sound. So yes, because it's creating space for making something come back after it's, after it's gone. But you could make tails in other ways. For instance, you could make a purely you could make an oscillator based synthesizer that had a tail, and then you wouldn't need a delay line to do it. So, so really, what the delay line is, a way that you can think of it is as a as a uh, circular buffer or as a loop of tape. So what you're doing is you're writing. The memory is arranged in a circle and not in a not in a segment, and you're just writing around in the circle continuously, so that five seconds later you rewrite the same thing that you had written before, and so on like that. But at any given moment in time, you can look back at uh, up to five seconds in the past, and it'll still be there. All right. Now, next uh, next thing about that is this. Save that. Um, people immediately think of the idea of making uh, recirculating delays. And what I'll do for pedagogical reasons is I will just make the, I'll make a very stupid design for a recirculating delay first, and then I'll start making it a little bit smarter. So the stupid thing that I could do is this. Let's make this be a thousand. Now let's test the delay line. Is it working? Yeah. Is it working? Okay, you can turn it up a little bit, a little dangerously. Now what I'm going to do, now what I'm gonna do is connect the del read back to the del write. So then I'll say something like, you will never forget this. Now 
Let's, okay, let's get that out of there. Okay, so it's still there, right? I just turned it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, this is making a, a perfect digital copy of the thing uh, so that it really literally will be the same thing tomorrow or next year uh, until I, of course, destroy the patch, which I will want to do pretty soon. Um, notice that I disconnected the ADC object from it. That's because in this design, I have a little bit of a disadvantage because, well, there's a there's another thing that's going to happen, which is that I can add other stuff to it. This either. And furthermore, if I keep letting that happen, if I keep letting that happen, then eventually I'll just get salad, right? And then it'll be just it'll just be too much. And so, what you would really want a patch to be able to do is not just uh, not just that, but maybe first off, it might be interesting to be able to have uh, s subsequent echoes be quieter than the original ones, uh, and or it might be a very good idea to be able to uh, to have your patch actually arranged in such a way that that you can control whether you're sending a signal to it or not. Right? That would be the send to the delay loop. Right? So now let's see. So we got this. So now we have, okay, play it. So let's do this. Okay, now, a um, <coughs> couple of things. One thing, uh, this is programming style, and this is a little personal. I have a tendency to try to put Dell writes higher on the screen than Dell reads, so that the delay reads downward. And then this line that went from the output of the Dell read back up to the Dell write is then feedback. And it looks like feedback when you connect the output of something lower in a patch to the input of something higher in the patch. You don't have to do it that way because, of course, you can jumble it around physically any way you want. But if you do it that way, it's easier to remember what you're doing, which is, a, which you could think is a good thing. Okay. Now, uh, now that I've done that, what I really want to do is make this controllable in the sort of obvious ways. And I'll, I'll go as far as to do that, and then I'll save that and go on to make another one with a with game. Right. So, so the important thing here is that um, we want to be able to turn the um, input on and off, so let's multiply it by I could be brutal and, and multiply it just by a toggle switch. Oh, by the way, uh, just to be pedagogical again, I'm going to uh, explicitly add these two signals except I can't without destroying my beautiful delay loop. So let's let's not yet, but oh, I can. Ooh, watch this. We're going to turn DSP off. <laughs> now the delay line is just sitting there, and now I can disconnect this. If you can't follow this, it's just, it's silly. Don't worry about it. <laughs> now I'm going to put a little plus in there. The patch is turned off while I'm doing all this editing, right? And now, I'm going to hook this up. Oh, except I want to be able to control the, the feedback path too. So let's do another one of these. I'm going to be sloppy with this one. Okay, so the del read will go to a multiplier. The ADC will also go to a multiplier. All right, I'm going to just be sloppy. And I'm not going to use line tildes. I'm just going to use toggles. If we were doing this for, for serious, we would use line tildes. Okay, so now there's a delay time, which we've set. And there are two toggles. And right now, this one I want to be recirculating, this one not. And then we'll turn it back on. And now I've got something where I can just say whatever I want. And finally, I can do this and get the thing to shut up so I can start over. This is another one. Right? All right. Okay, now, the court. Okay, I should have done this with lines instead of with toggles, so I'll leave you to think about all those little details. Why? Because these are just amplitude controls like any other. Is it clear what this patch is doing? Okay, it does need a couple of comments. The, uh, these controls should have names, and they should be on the patch. So this is going to be recirculation. Funny's happening with my mouse today. And this one is going to be, I think the right thing to call this is just send. 
In other words, this is a uh, this is a this is a control this is a sin to the delay line, right, which is not to be confused with from the, or with the return. This is uh, sound engineering language. You'd call a sin to the amp the, the gain by which you send some incoming signal to some kind of effect, and then you would call a return the gain by which you take the output of the effect and put in whatever uh, whatever speakers you have. Right. So I don't have any return control. The return well maybe this is a return control. It's semantics. But here's a sin control for sure, and here's the recirculation, which is a, which is a quality of the delay. <coughs> okay, so this is the basic recirculating delay line. All right, now I'm going to save this. Sorry, you know what? Can I add one more thing to this patch? Uh, this has an ADC. You you all. Um, if, if you're using laptops and, and the built-in microphones, you have a disadvantage because your uh, ADC is, uh, your, your mic is real close to your speaker. So I'm going to introduce a new object just to be able to ply this thing with a nice test signal. And it's going to be noise tilde. Ooh, except I'm going to be a little careful about this one. And I'm going to multiply it by some small number. Oops. Period. Okay, what, oh, so, what's noise? Noise is this. Well, you all know. All right. This is, um, you know, very 1960s pseudo-random white noise. Right, it's not truly randomness, but it's essentially what it would be if you had true randomness for, 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 for normal purposes and the strict definition of it is it's a stream of samples each sample of which is is a new random number completely regardless of every sample that's that's preceded it so it's a memorylessness a uh, memoryless um, noise generator and if I'm not lying to you the wow well, if I'm not lying to you the uh, range is from minus one to one just so that it doesn't have any DC in the long term all right, now that's a good thing to be using with this for a very pedagogically sound reason, which is that um, I want to talk a little bit about frequency responses of these things, and you will be able to hear frequency responses if I do, if, if I use noise as the input signal. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, oh, in fact, why don't I simplify the patch? I'll just make it so that you can hear the noise if you want. This is another sin. This is the noise sin, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, I don't know. Let's, all right. Good. Okay, we have noise. Now, what I'm going to do is compare that noise to this noise that we have here. It's now, both the noise and the delayed noise are being heard in the same speaker. And now I'm going to turn the delay time down to something like 10. And then you get something cool. All right. So in went noise, and out came something that had an audible pitch. This is the first example that you have seen. Well, no, it's the first. It's the it's the first example that you've seen of how you would make a filter. I've I've actually hauled out filters before because I've needed a high pass filter for a couple of reasons in uh, various spots in the in the past. But this is actually a filter with how the filter works, and what the filter does. Well, okay. What I'll, I'll I'll say what the filter does in two different ways. One thing that the filter does is it takes the incoming sound and lets you hear it, but also lets you hear it with a delay. So you hear two copies of the signal with with seven-ish milliseconds between them. Another thing that you hear is that certain frequencies are accentuated in the output, and certain other frequencies are not. And that's the aspect of filtering that makes us call it filters. The, the idea that different frequencies come in and are, are passed through more willingly than other frequencies. All right. Now, why would, yeah? Um, for the voice options, um, what does the inlet do? Nothing. 
I was too lazy to, I, I just forgot when I was writing it to tell PD to suppress drawing the inlet, and so it just has the inlet. ADC also has an inlet that does nothing. Uh, there might be one or two others. And every once in a while that question comes up on the PD list. <laughs> so the moral is doing nothing is often not quite nothing enough. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so, um, all right. So just to analyze what this thing does, let's, um, okay, so let's, let's make it, for, for ease of, of thinking about it, let's make this thing 10 milliseconds. So now we hear a pitch. And what would that pitch be? Well, okay, to think about that, what would happen when you put certain sinus, oh, rats. I'm skipping some theoretical stuff. So I'm, um, I'm not explaining that you can think of incoming sounds as consisting of sinusoidal components. When and in what sense you can do that is something that audio engineers just sort of assume and which I won't tell you more about than just to assume it, right? Uh, because the mathematics is hairy. So assuming that you think that, that, that some very complicated signal like noise tilde might actually com uh, consist or be describable as a sum of different sinusoids of different frequencies. And of course, it's folk knowledge. White noise really is every single frequency at, with equal amplitude, just like white light could be every single optical frequency at the same amplitude, although it's not, because it depends what temperature it is. But that's, but that's another thing that we don't have to worry about. White noise in, in audio land really is a signal which contains every frequency that, that uh, the digital signal can represent and, and contains them all at equal amplitudes. And we'll just sort of forget about DC and the Nyquist for now because those might be special cases. All right, so if you think of it that way, then um, what about some component, what, what about some possible component frequency of, of the noise signal? For instance, uh, what, if it, what if there were a 100 hertz uh, sinusoid sitting in there? Well, you would hear the 100 hertz sinusoid here, and you would hear the 100 hertz sinusoid one period later, because the period of a 100 hertz sinusoid is 10 milliseconds, right? And so you would, hear, you would get the same signal coming out of here for 100 hertz sinusoid as you get coming out of here, and so it would sound, it would be doubled in amplitude. It would sound somewhat louder. If I put in 50 hertz, then something different happens because 10 milliseconds in a 50 hertz signal, so the 50 hertz signal now has a period of 20 milliseconds. So 10 milliseconds is long enough to wait for the sinusoid to change sign, right? No matter what phase it had at the outset, it's going to be minus what it was a half period later. So what that means is that at 50 hertz, this signal has one, has, uh, has the amplitude which is exactly the negative of the amplitude of this signal. And they cancel each other out. And since we're adding, since we're, we're putting it out both here and here at the same amplitude, we are <coughs> not putting anything out of, uh, at 50 hertz. Now, if you want me to really prove that, prove it. Uh, prove it as in a laboratory. Let's make a nice oscillator and let's ask it to play 50 hertz for us. And then I'll turn it up here, although maybe not all the way to 92. Oh, 50 hertz is kind of low, so, all right. And then I'll turn it up here, too. Dick, went away. Okay, uh, I hope this is making it on the tape. Oh, you know what? Let's, um, let's do the same experiment, but let's do it at a lower delay and a higher frequency. So now what I'm going to do is make the delay be a mere 2 milliseconds. Ooh, now we got it back. But I'm going to make the oscillator be 250 hertz. So now you can hear the oscillator just fine if I just play it. But if I add the delayed copy of it, it goes away. All right. If, on the other hand, I had the oscillator going at 500 hertz, then if I add the delayed copy, 
just makes it louder. 6 dB louder to be explicit. And so on. So just probing this thing with oscillators, which is a perfectly respectable way to, to find out what a filter does, by the way. Um, what happened is, oh, at DC, I, uh, I didn't tell you what happens at DC, but of course, if you put a constant signal down the delay line, you'll get the same thing out after any delay that you want, and so they will add. The delayed copy will be the same as the original. So very low frequencies will, will come out, but by the time I hit 250, it'll be gone. And then by the time I go to 500, it comes back at, full, at double strength, and then at 750, it goes away again. Now, that's worth stopping and worrying about for a second. Why, seven, why did that happen for 750? Okay, so well, what's the easiest way to do the math here? So 250 hertz, this one. The period of this is 4 milliseconds, and the delay line is 2 milliseconds, which is 1 half of the period. All right. If I make this 750, then the period of that is 3 quarters of a millisecond. No, wait, I'm doing it wrong. 750, right? So. If it were 1,000, it would be a millisecond, so it's 750, so it is four-thirds of a millisecond. A millisecond and a third. And then, if you make a delayed copy two milliseconds later, the period... Yeah, all right. So the period's a millisecond and a third. So how many periods then fit in two milliseconds? I was trying to make this easy to do in one's head, but it's not. I'm sorry. It's one and a half period. So we have one and a third milliseconds. That's four thirds. And then a half of that again is two thirds. And four thirds plus two thirds is two. Six thirds are two. And so this is one and a half of these periods. So what that means is that we're hearing it here and we're hearing it there, not a half period later, but one and a half period later, which for practical purposes is the same thing. Similarly, if I go up to a thousand, now the period is one millisecond and two is then two periods. So two, that number, which is constant or is fixed for now, is a half period of this one, it is one period of this one, it is one and a half periods of this one. It is two periods of this one. It's two and a half periods of this one, and so on. Whoops. What happened? Why do I hear that? Ooh. The reason I hear that we truncation error. Um, this is two milliseconds, but we're running at a rate of 44k1, so the delay is not exactly 2 milliseconds. And so I didn't succeed in notching it out exactly. And so you hear a very quiet little tone. It might be 40 dB down, but you're hearing the error in, in, the, in the allowable length of the delay line. So there's a thing about delay lines I have to tell you about, which is that the, well, sorry, the thing about Dell Reed tilde that I have to tell you about, which is this. It will read an old sample of, of the file, but, or sorry, of the, of the sound that's going in, of the signal that's going down the Dell right. But it's limited to integer number of samples of delay. It won't interpolate for you to try to guess what the thing would be at, at um, you know, five and a half samples ago. It will either do five samples ago or six samples ago. So going back to this example, truncation error is, is sort of giving me the lie, but I'll I'll do the I'll continue the experiment anyway. So 250, yet 500, got it. Uh, 750, no. 1,000, yes. 1250, almost no. <laughs> 1500, yes. 1750, almost no. Still there. 2,000, yes. Okay. So the things that got that they got through were 500. 
a thousand, whoops, thousand, sorry, uh, fifteen hundred and two thousand, and seeing the pattern, it's all it's going to be all the multiples of five hundred, and all of the numbers in halfway in between those multiples, all the integer multiples of five hundred. So all the half integer multiples of five hundred, like two fifty, seven fifty, twelve fifty, and so on, are getting notched out, as an audio engineer would say. They're getting canceled out by the delayed copy. All right. Now, going back to the example of noise. Should I add that? I should add it. This, this is the oscillator sin. And then I'll just make a separate one for the noise so that so that it's all nice and clear. So I'll put an adder here. And I'll make yet another one which is a noise. Oh, is it going to fit? Duplicate. All right, it's getting messy. We're going to have to stop real soon. Course it's noise. No. Now we're going to add that, and then we're going to throw that in here. By the way, I'm being a little sloppy there. I'm using this uh, inlet of add to be another add. So this is a stylistic thing for me. You just put a plus tilde, and then you throw as much stuff into it as you want. It's making it clear that it's all getting added anyway. Better than just throwing it all in the inlet here for some reason. Okay, so now we're sending the oscillator. We're listening to. Oh wait, I want to hear it here. And now we're going to hear the oscillator. And we're going to, oops, check this. The amplitudes, by the way, need to be exactly the same for this to work perfectly. Right? All right, so that was the oscillator example. And here's the noise example. And then you get the thing which is roughly 500 hertz, which you know, it's not too far from C above middle C here. Oops, that's what I could be. Sorry. Okay, so that's that's a 500 hertz tone, sort of. Oh, you can compare it to what happens when I make the oscillator be 500 hertz. Okay. Uh, observations about this. Okay, I'm going to save this, and now really it's time for me to start a new patch because it's getting too crowded. So. This is, this is the end of this patch. Okay, so observation about this. Um, this is a linear process. The, the linear process meaning taking a signal and making a delayed copy of it and, uh, and adding the two or even not. So any, any well, make, adding any number of delayed copies of the signal to the original signal is a linear process in the sense that if you add two signals in, you will get the result of what happened if you put the two signals in separately. Um, it is furthermore time invariant, by which one means that if you put something into the network now, or if you put it in a minute later or a second later, you get the same thing out as if it, as if you just put the original thing in and, and just done the whole thing a second later. You could not. You could have things that are not time invariant. An ex a very good example of something that's not time invariant is multiplying by a sinusoid. That's to say ring modulation. Because at one moment it's putting the thing through positive and one moment it's putting th the thing through negative. So if you put an impulse into it at some point, it would be positive or negative or nothing depending on when you put the impulse in. That's, so that's not time invariant. This is time invariant. If you put an impulse in here at any time or, or any other time, you'll get the same thing out simply at that time. All right. Um, it's a property of linear time invariant systems that you can fully describe them by finding out what they do to sinusoids. Um, it's the, the, the way in the past that we have generated frequencies that weren't present in an incoming signal. So there have been lots of examples where you have an oscillator and then, you, and then you make different frequencies come out either by multiplying it by another oscillator, which is not time invariant, or by running it through a nonlinear so-called transfer function, which is wave shaping, 
Each of those things is capable of generating frequencies that aren't present in the original signal. But it is in general true of a linear time invariant transformation that whatever, sig whatever frequency you get out, what am I saying? If you put, if you put a, a sinusoid in, you will get a sinusoid out at that same frequency. Yeah? Could you explain uh, time invariance again? Okay, so time invariance is this. Um, it's that if you, yeah, how do I say? Okay, so, can, so it's, it's, a, it's a process and it has an input and an output, okay? And so make an input, run the process and get the output. And now make the input delayed by any amount of time you want and apply the same process, you will get the output delayed by the same amount. So the laws of physics are, believe, are probably time invariant because if you drop an apple today or drop an apple tomorrow, the same thing happens, although it happens a day later. <coughs> and then explain why uh, multiplying by an oscillator is not time invariant uh, because it depends on what phase the... Yeah, phase right, depends on what, right, exactly. Okay, so I'm not going to try to explain why a linear and time invariant system has this wonderful property, but good things about these, well, it would be good if your amplifier was linear and time invariant, right? Um, it would also be good if your speaker system was, right? Because if you, well, if, 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 you're, if you heard frequencies coming out of your speaker that weren't in the recording or, or a thing that you were generating, then you would think that there was something wrong with the speaker. Like you would call it harmonic distortion or something like that. Um, linear time invariance doesn't make up frequencies for you. It does, however, or can, however, change the amplitudes of, of, of sounds at different frequencies. In other words, it can change amplitude in a frequency dependent way. And this is a very um, simple example of that where I'm throwing in sinusoids and the, ones, the happy ones that are multiples of 500 are getting doubled in amplitude, and the ones that are halfway in between them are getting, are getting zeroed in amplitude. Right? So, so, what we, so that is a thing which we would call a filter for, I don't know what, historical reasons. But everyone, I think, has this folk knowledge of what a filter should be and do, and this is, this is basically how you make filters. You make them out of delays. So delays, now, just to, um, let's see, I don't want to change the patch, but I will. Uh, let's go back to doing the send thing. So now, let's see, we're sending, and we're, oh, yeah, so why don't I, why don't I make the patch even more readable than it was by doing the same thing to all the three sources, which is to say adding them up like that. That didn't make the patch very much more readable. Let's see. All right. Then I can lower these. There. That's good. Okay. So now, here's the here's the uh, original patch. Maybe. Let's see. I have to make it a little louder before this is good for anything. So now this is my voice being filtered in the same way. And you might be able to tell that there is, there's some kind of timbral variation. Actually, you'll hear it clearly if I turn the filtering off. So here's the original voice. Uh, there's, you hear some proximity effect because the mic's too close to my voice because the game's too low. But it's basically what's going in, right? And here's now the filtered result, which is, you know, 5,000, 1,500, and 2,500 accentuated everything else. You know, uh, other frequencies not, right? Okay, or, yeah, you could now say, let me have this as a continuously variable process. So, uh, I don't know if that's even, I don't know if you can tell anything's going on there. But what you're hearing is a varying filter. I'm doing this in a rather sloppy way. Oh, in fact, I can make it, I can do it in a more easy to understand way by using noise again, less amplitude. Noise. And now we have. We can do that sort of stuff. Okay. And that is changing the. That's changing the, the frequency response of the filter. Okay. What is a frequency response? 
frequency response is, is a name for the, um, for at any given frequency, what is the gain of the filter? So the frequency response is a curve, or it's a function of frequency, which in this case uh, has a shape like that, has peaks every, you know, has peaks at multiples of, of, a, of a fixed frequency. And you can change that fixed frequency, which is therefore changing the, um, the frequency response of the filter in this very audible way. Now, that is, that's what, that's what you get when, or that's what the filter is doing for you when you have very short delays. Let's go back to voice now. And then, so there's, so this is a thing, oh, here we are. That, this is a thing which either can give you this kind of effect. Hello? Why are we not hearing anything? Oh, because I'm doing the wrong thing. Hello? So now we're doing something that you hear in the time domain. So that, now, the, the delay time now is more than the magic 30 milliseconds, which is something like the threshold of what you will hear as a, as a time interval. So if it's more than 30 milliseconds, you get this. And if it's less than 30-ish milliseconds, you'll start getting things that are describable as filters. And by the way, notice I've, I've been sloppy about this without explaining to you that this is a, that this is a problem. But of course, if you test this thing carefully, you'll see you'll hear that it does that when you change the delay time. Right? That's exactly the same effect as if is if you were reading a, uh, if you were using an array as a sample, as a, as a recorded sound, and suddenly jump from one spot in the, in the recorded sound to another without controlling it by enveloping it somehow. And it's that for the same reason almost, which is that if you change the delay, you're changing, essentially you're, you're, you're stopping playing the thing at one delay and you're starting playing it discontinuously at another delay. It's, it's almost exactly the same thing as if you picked the needle up at, on a recording and dropped it somewhere else instantaneously. It will cause a discontinuity in the signal. Right. And I, that wasn't a problem before because I was changing it by small enough amounts. And I was doing this with a shift key. You can still hear that it's a problem, but I was able to sort of talk over it and hide the zipper noise effect. But now that I've sensitized you to it, you should be hearing it. All right, well, that is this patch in gory detail. Yeah, I, I, I haven't turned the recirculation back on since I've been doing this for a good reason, which is that the recirculation made sense when I had the delay time up to some large byte. So the recirculation example was I had a 1,000 here. And then I could do something like turn on the recirculation and then give it a couple of proofs of, of say, an oscillate. Ooh. What's it doing now? It's already got stuff in it. Let's zero it out. Okay, so now I can just say, whoops. Okay, this is, the, this is now back to what I did at the very beginning of the class, which is just a recirculating delay network, where if you want to you don't want to be putting things through in a continuous way, which is what I have been doing when I've been describing the, the way this thing acts as a filter. You can actually think of this as a filter, but it wouldn't be a really good filter because, <coughs> um, because its frequency response would be in infinite at any frequency except one that was very carefully chosen to be notched out. So to put that another way, for instance, if I just put uh, DC into it. If I just put a signal that had a constant value of 1, it would just add on to itself and it would continue doing that forever and eventually you would have an arbitrarily loud or an arbitrarily uh, large uh, number coming out. Right. So this is out of the range of operation where you really would think of it as a filter. It's, this, is, this is using it in, as something else. I'm not sure what. Okay, so delay lines are, us are usable as filters, but there are delay effects which uh, would be unstable if you left them in place for any amount of time, and so you can't regard them as a thing that you can do in a continuous way in time, and therefore you probably shouldn't think of those as filters, but as other things. Questions about this? Right. How would you remove the zipper noise in the 
how would you remove the zipper noise? I've been saving that for a little later because there are a couple of ways you can do it depending on what you want. Yeah. Um, you can do it. Uh, in fact, you have to do it to be able to do the homework. <laughs> uh, so what's the formula? Yeah. So for instance, if I wanted to do, if I wanted to do middle C. Well, yeah. And I've been resisting hauling out the X per tilde object, which allows just, just to type out formulas, which is, of course, a great thing to be able to do, but there's syntax, which I, I haven't yet found a thing that's really been unavoidable. But, but how would you compute? Well, okay, this, so one hertz should correspond to 1,000, right? Two hertz should correspond to 500, and so on like that. So the, the general formula is this thing should be 1,000 divided by the frequency in hertz. And to divide a thousand by something, so so it's this is worth knowing how to do. So here's a number. We're going to convert it to frequency, MIDI to frequency, and then that's going to give us a nice number again, which I'll look at. But now what I want to do is take a thousand divided by that. So to do that, I have to get I have okay. So I need a thousand down here, which is a message because I don't want that value to change. And then I want to divide that by this number. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I need an object. I'm sorry. Ugh, go away. You can take 1,000 divided by this, but we have to then bang the 1,000 after we put this number in. And so we need a trigger. Yep. Trigger, bang, float. And I usually space this like this when I'm doing this. I think that's decently readable. And now we do this. <laughs> Destroy the coherence of our patch. And now I say middle C, please. And it says, yeah, you want 3.822 milliseconds. And theoretically now, if we play noise through this, get these two gains the same, yeah. That should be this pitch. One other thing I should warn you about about this, uh, this is abstruse and weird. Um, there's a minimum amount of delay that you can get into a recirculating network for a technical reason, which is that PD does everything in blocks of 64 audio samples um, just to save computation. As a result of which, um, since the delay write needs the delay reads output to be able to write into it, that output is a block. And so the minimum amount of delay that you can have in this loop is one block worth. And without trying to explain that any better than I have already, what I'm going to do is just show you that, whoops, come here. Everything is hunky-dory until you get up to a certain delay here. And then it stops. It stops right at, I think it stops right at 1.45. And that 1.45 is the number of milliseconds in 64 samples at 44,100 sample rate, if you compute that. You don't have to compute that now. But. Uh, I hit that number a lot because it's, well, it's the length of a block of 64 samples in time. That also is the uh, numerical accuracy of the line object. If you ask it to do something at a specific time, the time actually will be the nearest one of these, which can be a limitation. And if that's a limitation, go look up the V line <coughs> object, which, which corrects for that. Okay, so this is, okay, so I did promise you I wasn't going to add stuff to this patch, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. What can I do? I have to, 
I kind of I'll leave this in. Okay, so I'm going to use a send here. I don't know how I'm going to deal with making this be a readable patch when I try to put it up on the web, but <laughs> for now we'll just do this. R is short for receive. Oh, so I should use S here to be clear. All right, so there's that. Now, the next topic is what if you want to have a recirculating delay and not have it last forever the way I had it last in this example? And of course, it's easy. You just take it and multiply it by some gain that's less than one each time around. But even though that's easy, I want to show it to you because it has interesting ramifications and there are interesting things that you can think about it. All right, so I'm now going to save as. That was three, delay recirculate. So this is going to be four, delay gain recirculate. <laughs> Sorry, long name. Uh, here, what I'm going to do, let's see, I'm not sure what incoming signals we need. <coughs> Um, all right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one where the assumption is that we're always recirculating. <laughs> so instead of having the recirculating be on off, I'll make it be a nice number box. And in fact, I think what I want to do is have the number box be in one hundredths for sanity's sake. All right, and now that I've done that, let's see, I'm going to increase the. Well, actually, let's 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 be middle C still. And now I'm going to say noise, please. It's going in there, so we can listen to it. Okay, now all you hear there is unfiltered white noise because the noise is going in. Oh, I should. You know what? I'm going to make a. I'm going to make an improvement to the patch. I'm going to listen to the output of this adder. In fact, I'm, yeah. Okay. And are we still here? Yeah. So now we're putting noise in. We're not putting the oscillator in or, or the ABC, just noise. And the noise is getting multiplied by zero as it gets read and then recirculated. So we hear nothing but the original noise. As I turn this value up, I get more and more recirculation, which gives me a more and more nearly pure tone. Okay, I'm going to stay away from 100 for now. Okay. All right. So now to, to go back to no, not a thousand this time. How about 150? Okay, now I'm going to go back to talking into it. So now I'm talking into the thing, and you hear just my voice with no delay. And now I turn up the recirculation. And now everything that you hear has several copies. And now this is the thing that you've heard probably piano go through. Push my input gain up. Because I'll be over there. <laughs> Actually, I have a switch, but I'm not sure I would think in time. Okay, so here's here's these delays, and now what's happening right now is that each delay is 63 percent as loud as the previous one. Oh, this is the. Hey, you guys, don't listen to that. Okay. Right. Okay. So the bigger I make this, the longer the sound stays around until. 
I foolishly push this past 100, and then it actually grows. And you don't want to leave it like that. That's an unstable filter. Right? Filters can be unstable. And what happens when you have an unstable filter is pretty soon everything is just right? So you can do it. It's mathematically possible, but it might not be what you want, really. <coughs> Um, so that's so. This now is making a recirculating delay. Okay, so things about it's it's very feedback prone. Use, use with caution. It also is a bit of a special effect, and it's way overused. Another thing about it is um, this is close to what is um, uh, what you do if you want artificial reverberation. So if you wanted to make me sound like I was speaking in a in a church or a music hall or something like that, you would do something like this, except that you would want there to be a, uh, you'd want the echoes to be a lot closer to each other in time. Like maybe this, hello. And then you have to turn the recirculation up. And then you get something a little bit unexpected yet. You got some, some feedback here, I haven't watched it. So now, it's not a nice cathedral reverb sound at all, it's got a pitch. Okay, so the reason I dropped, let me just turn this off. The reason I dropped the delay time to something short, right now it's 13 milliseconds. The reason I dropped that was so that, um, so that the echoes would be close to each other because when, the, when this was a larger value in milliseconds, maybe I dropped this a little bit now, then you just heard, the, you heard a bunch of echoes. Right? So this is not a nice reverberator because you, you, know, you play a drum and you hear that. Okay. Now we're come together. Right? Okay. Um, but if I decide to try to make the echoes denser, then I get I'm down below the magic value of 30 and I start getting pitches again. Right. In fact, at this point, I can just dial this thing up like this. Hello, this is your professor on drugs. <laughs> so now I'm start, all I'm doing is filtering, right? OK, so there's some things I haven't told you about this. OK, so it was filtering. It was perfectly filtering before I put the recirculation in. But you notice that when I put the recirculation in, the filtering got a lot stronger. Right, that's a that's a loose way of saying it, right? What what the what really happened was I replaced the non-recirculating filter with a different filter, which is recirculating, which has the property that it can have very very sharp resonances, which you will perceive as pitches. And this this is a, this is the Karpla Strong technique that I uh, referenced in the homework at the beginning of the class. This is this is a thing which no matter what you put into it, out comes. Thing that was happening at the pitch that you dialed up here, right? And oh, and furthermore, what you do is reflected in the timbre of what comes out. So different kinds of impulses going in give you different timbres coming out. It's a little bit like what happens on a, on a stringed instrument when you pluck it, right? The, the, uh, those of you who play guitar, uh, when you pluck the string, the sound of the tone is pretty much the sound of the pluck dying out. Of course, the higher frequencies die out a little faster and lower, so that's not quite true. But the moment that you get to really control the timbre of a, of a <coughs> guitar or piano string, it just <coughs> thing gets hit. Because after that, it's just ringing. It's, it's doing its own thing after that. And this is, this is a very, well, it's a fairly close imitation of that process. It's at least a, a conceptual imitation of it, where you you send you put the signal on the string, it runs down the string and comes back up and you get it again, and every time it goes by you get it again, right? So a guitar you could or a string instrument in some sense you could think of as being a recirculating delay line. And that turns out only to be an approximation. But it, it's a good enough approximation to capture certain aspects of it. Here, uh, try as you might, it's going to be hard to make this actually sound like a guitar. I mean, it sounds like it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like a computer trying to be a guitar. Um, 
if you give it something that has more high frequencies, then you can almost get uh, make yourself believe that you're hearing a struck string of some sort, like a string being hit with a uh, mallet of some sort. And furthermore, uh, if you yeah, if you could, I'm not going to build the patch to do this right now, but if you could turn this noise on and off very, very rapidly so that you made a burst of noise, then you would get a very sharp signal that, um, that would sound in the same way that that FM tone sounds like a clarinet, that would sound like a harpsichord. Okay. And in fact, that is exactly what I did in my patch here, which is the homework demonstration patch, which I might still have up. Let's see. It looks like I got rid of it. So let's go get it again. Oh, there it is. So this thing. All right. So the homework is, is simply to take this principle and build it into a nice polyphonic instrument so that it can do something reminiscent of homework six two weeks ago. And of course, you'll be tired of that stupid random melody, so you can make something more fun. Yeah? Um, with this process, is this kind of like a basis for a vocoder? It sounds a lot like a vocoder. Uh, in particular, as, well, the thing that makes it sound like a vocoder is when you put your voice in it, into it, right? This is, it's, it's really, you can almost think of it as an alternative to a vocoder. Mm -hmm. oh, why did it not do it anymore? Oh. I probably. Seven. Ah, sure enough. So why do I hear anything now? Hmm. That's weird. Do I? Okay, let's turn DSP off. Is the preview Hello? Is there a preview switch on your on your board? There might be. I'll have, I'm not going to look for it now. I think there's probably something. There's probably a monitor switch down there that's turned on. Um, so sorry about that. But all right, so let's ignore that for now. And what I'll do is just start sending the ADC to this, and now we get, hello? Yeah, so now this, so the question is, is this a vocoder? And the answer for me is, well, okay, first off, a vocoder usually lets you put the sound in, that this thing is, is forcing you just to be a uh, pitch of 60, right? So a vocoder is a more powerful thing than this in some ways, uh, in a lot of important ways. Another thing is that this, uh, if you compare this to sort of the standard vocoder sound, the, the vocoder sound has, is a great deal more um, local in time. So this doesn't respond real fast. In particular, it doesn't, in particular, it doesn't, it doesn't shut up real fast when you stop talking. It, so everything gets squashed out over a certain period of time, which a good vocoder wouldn't do to you. So you could, you know, this is almost a, uh, so this is a cheap wannabe vocoder. Other questions about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, right now you have the microphone on the effect of the model, but in this patch, how would you, how would you program the, the, like, um, the effect of the mix? Oh, that would be easy. You would just. Uh, you get another level of control, yeah, and then you get the ADC and just send it straight out like that. And then this would be the this would be the so-called dry signal in audio parlance, and this would be the wet signal. Well, you could, yeah. So you could add the ADC into this, and then you, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more a question of just how you want to define that, or how you, how do you want the interface to be, right? Because basically, there it boils down to two different levels, one or another. All right, so the thing that I want to tell you about the I think. I'm realizing 15 minutes, do I really want to explain why the frequency response is what it is? Or do I want to not touch that with a pole? I think what I should, okay, I'm going to tell you how you would find out and I'm, not, and I'm going to avoid going into the uh, gory details um, for the simple reason that 
it might be useful to come back to the to this uh, in two weeks' time, and so it will, will have been nice to have been gotten started. And then, anyway, if I never managed to follow up on it, then you've at least seen where you have, where you can find out more about it. So this is now a tour through um, through theory. Um, theory. So let's go over here. Um, book. So we are now in chapter seven of the book, which is time shifts and delays. Chapter eight of the book is filters. <coughs> and filters are really, as I've explained, they're really just um, a psychological um, is that the right word? They're a point of view on, on, on time shifts. In other words, filters are made out of, out of combining signals with time delayed copies of themselves. Uh, including the possibility of recirculation, which, as you've seen, simply has the effect of adding more and more copies in it. Um, uh, right. Uh, in, yeah. Basically, it just adds a train of copies instead of just adding a single copy if you make the thing recirculate. So, if you learn all about uh, time delays or what um, time shifting, which is this, which is time delaying, if, if you make it a real time process. Um, if you know all about that, then one of the things you can ask is, what are the time or what's the frequency response of the network? And a, um, a good definition of a filter, I think, is it's a delay network that was designed in order to get a particular frequency or phase response, usually frequency response. So, uh, so one thing that you one thing that you want to know about in delays is how how do you how do you uh, sort of predict the frequency response? Uh, and then when you're doing filtering, it's not just how do you predict the frequency response, but I want a frequency response that acts like this. How would I set about designing a filter that had that? So, the, so filter design in some sense turns the, turns the question around, whereas in, in a delay, if you're just making delay networks, you might just sort of ask what would the response be in the filter thing. You posit the response and, and work backwards to try to, to get a delay network that does it for you. At least that's the way I think of it. All right, so delay networks have other things that you can talk about about them besides the frequency response, but I just want to talk about that for now in order to prepare for whatever little bits of filtering we are able to get into in the last week of class before we do gym, which is, of course, what everyone really wants to see. Um, and what I want to do is just talk about, for, I'm going to take this slightly out of order because I'm going to motivate the uh, jive about complex numbers by showing you uh, how you, first, how you think about time shifts and how they change the phase of the thing. Okay. So just to just to do the hand waving thing, of course shifting a signal in time, such as delaying it, changes the phase of uh, well, changes the phases of all of the component sinusoids. And of course I shouldn't say of course there because that is presupposing this deep thing that you can think about a signal as being a sum of sinusoids in the first place. But if you could and if you had something linear and time invariant, which we do, so that we're not making frequencies up that we didn't have before and so on like that, then you can say, yes, uh, I will just describe what this thing could do to a sinusoid, and that will describe what it does to anything. So then we say, all right, we're just going to send sinusoids down our, down our delay network and ask what happens then. And the answer is, you put it down in delay, you get out a sinusoid of the same amplitude in a different phase. And then if you, for instance, add that to an, a non-delayed copy of the signal, then you will get phase cancellation or not, depending on the depending on the relationship between the two phases you got. So if you can predict the phase, then you can go do the math and, and, and work out what the response is going to be. So how do you predict the phase? Well, it's easy. The, um, the frequency of a sinusoid is just how much the phase changes from one sample to the next. So the and if you do it in appropriate units, the phase change associated with a delay of, of say, d samples is just going to be d times the frequency, actually minus d times the frequency of the sinusoid that you put in. Why minus? Because if you delay it, then that gives it... If you delay it, then you're listening to what it was earlier in time, and so it's actually phased backwards. But if you think too hard about that, then you will get mixed up. So, so it's best just to sort of remember that it's minus d times. Oh, minus d times the frequency if you express the frequency as 
degrees or radians per sample, which is the good way to describe frequencies when you're doing design, filter design and that. Okay, so time shifts and phase changes. What's a time shift? A time shift is just, I give you a signal X and you give me a signal Y, which is X D samples ago, and N is just, uh, N is just now. N is, N is the number of 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Okay. And then, what happens when you time shift a, ooh, now I have to go back and, okay, so now I'm motivating complex numbers. If you have a real, if you have a real value sinusoid, it gets ugly. It's, it's cosine of omega n plus phi. In a, so call it cosine of omega n. It's the cosine of something. Maybe there's an amplitude. When you, if you ask what's a, uh, if, if I gave you a sinusoid that contained only a positive frequency, it would be a complex valued sinusoid with a simpler formula, which is that the nth sample, so x of n, that's the nth sample of my sinusoid, is some constant amplitude times a complex number raised to the nth power. That's all it is. So a sinusoid is an exponential sequence. And then it's really easy to say what happens when you delay it. Because if you take an exponential sequence and delay it, you've all had to do this because you had to add uh, exponential sequences in high school. Geometric sequences are called. Right? So adding geometric series, what you do is you consider what happens when you just delay it and then subtract it off from the original. You just get a multiple of the original and so you know how to deal with it. <coughs> and so this thing, if Clearly, if you, if you substituted, if you said y of n is x of n minus d, in other words, you delayed it d times, all you would be doing is you would just be dividing by z to the d. Okay, now this, the possible misconception that you would have here is z is not going to be an ordinary number like a half, because, of course, a half to the n is not a good sign, so that's a dying exponential. A good number to, to raise against to, to do that with would be a complex number which lives on the unit circle. So now I have to go back and show you complex numbers so that this can apply to sinusoids. Okay, so now I'm going to go back. So what I did was I sneak previewed time shifts and phase changes to show you that I wanted to have a nice exponential sequence so that I would know what time shift it did to it. And, I, and I, I was trying to compare that with what happens if you just look at the real numbers, and then you had to say cosine of omega n. And then when you say cosine of omega n minus d, then you have to use the cosine sum angle formula, and your formulae grow much faster. So you were much happier with, with what it is in complex land. And what I want to do is show you, without going into the how and why and everything else of it, Here's what z is. All right, so this is the complex plane. The complex plane is the thing that you forgot after you got out of, out of um, pre-calc, right? Um, this is the real axis. This is the imaginary axis. Complex numbers in general are have a real part and an imaginary part, which put them somewhere on the plane because you can treat them as coordinates. And so instead of a number line in the real real end, you have a number plane for the complex numbers. And everything that's good about the real numbers, almost, is still true about the complex numbers. You can multiply them, add them, all the good, all the usual good rules hold. Uh, one, of course, has a real part of one and an imaginary part of zero. And in general, if you make a number which lives on the unit circle, that's to say the real part and the imaginary part you add their squares up to you one. So that's the that's the circle, which is maybe a squared plus b squared equals one. Right. Uh, this is called a <coughs> unit complex number, and it turns out that if you if you take one of these unit complex numbers and square it, all you do is you get that angle further on the circle. So numbers on the real line here, if you start multiplying them, they start going in and out. Numbers that are on the unit circle in the complex plane, if you start multiplying them, they stay on the unit circle. And all you do is you change their angle. So complex numbers know all about trigonometry. They just do trig for you. Like that's why you use it in fact, so you don't have to do trig. 
So in particular, if I, if I, for instance, consider the sequence 1, z, z squared, z cubed, I didn't tell you this, but actually this angle is the same as this angle, or this arc is the same as that arc is the same as this arc, and so on. So if I gave you the series, the sequence of, of numbers 1, z, z squared, and so on, we would be going at a constant rate around the unit circle. And then if you only look at how that projected onto the real axis, you would see a nice sinusoid. It would look like cosine omega t, or cosine omega n, if omega was this angle from here up to z. It's called the argument of z, if you like, but you could just call it the angle of z. And that would be the frequency <laughs> in radians per sample of, of your complex sinusoid. So this picture says that 1z, z squared, blah, blah, is a sinusoid, which has, happens to have happens to have zero phase at the beginning of time, which is here. And it also happens to have unit amplitude. And now, if you take that and multiply it by some other, some arbitrary complex number, capital A, which is an amplitude, it's a complex amplitude that has not just a size, but also a direction. That, then you would get a series, sorry, a sequence of numbers, A, AZ, AZ squared. They would be advancing at the same angle but they would have a different amplitude and a different phase. So these numbers here, A, A, Z, A, Z squared, and so on, that is the most general form for a sinusoid. That's the output of an oscillator in general, a sinusoidal oscillator. And furthermore, it has this very simple mathematical form, which you can do stuff with. In particular, you can delay it. Because you just, delay just means rotate it by some number of, by some multiple times the angle omega. Right? Furthermore, you can add two of them. So if you have one with an amplitude, if, if, if the frequency of the two is the same, if one of their amplitudes is A out this way and other is an amplitude B out that way, you just add A and B as complex numbers, which is a vector sum, and you get, and you see graphically what the amplitude and phase will be of the sum of those two sinusoids. So that's all delay networks do. They delay things and they superpose them, which is to say they add them up. And you know what delays do now? They just rotate, and you know what adding does? It just adds, but it adds these vectors. And now you have the tool that you need to, to predict the frequency response and phase response, for that matter, of any kind of delay network that I can put out. So that's the pep talk. <laughs> uh, which is enough for now. Um, if, if there's some time, actually, especially when we get into filters as such, I'll, I'll want to try to show you how you translate that into like a nice band pass filter for your synth. But it's all here, basically. This is, this is what the engineers all do when they're designing these filters. Moog, Bukla, you know, it's all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> First off, it's a cone filter, which means that, that uh, wh whatever you see, it, it repeats itself every, every, you know, every, every so often, depending on the period. The, the smaller the period of, of the delay line, the smaller the length of the delay line, the, the more separated this thing get. Until if you make the delay line one sample, you only get one hump. It reaches all the way from zero to nine foot. And so that's how you get it not to just repeat. But then how do you get it to move around? And that is a little bit harder, but you just need to be able to shift things right back to the frequency. Oh, so the low pass, what's the cone filter? The low pass is nothing but, and the cone filter had, had, a, had a response of 2 at DC, and it had a response of 0 at the first notch. So you put that first notch at the micros, and it goes from 2 down to micros. Oh, sorry, it goes down from 2 to 0 from DC to micros, and then it's the low pass. Then you would change the recirculation to get it started, which would be if you push it, you can push it more towards DC. I mean a little hand wavy there, but that's basically what happens. 
And then when you want to move the peak off of zero so that it has a resonance, then you have to work harder.